Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really great to be here and uh, thank you all for joining. Um, I'm going to talk about the three gap theorem and higher, uh, higher dimensional generalizations. Um, it's, it's of course an old theorem from the 50s um, and it, it still inspires a lot of uh, uh, new work. It has many proofs um, and I hope I, I can um, show you today uh, uh, some new aspects that um, we've recently discovered with Alan Haynes in Houston and it's, it's built as you will see on some ideas um, with Andrea Strimbergson from Uppsala. Now, um, to put this into context, let's start with what I think is one of the, the, the most beautiful theorems in, uh, in number theory and mathematics in general. That's um, the uniform distribution mod one of fractional parts of polynomials, um, proved by Weil in, in 1916. Now, you will all know this result, but let me just um, state it here. So you take, um, and I'm focusing here on just uh, the, the simple monomials here, n to the d alpha mod one. Um, if alpha is irrational, this is uniformly distributed. And what that statement means uh, is just written down here. So for any continuous function on um, uh, r modulo z, um, the average of uh, n d to the alpha mod one converges to Lebesgue measure. Now, that, that was a real breakthrough paper. That's something Hardy and Littlewood couldn't do. Um, and if you like, it's the birth really of harmonic analysis because what Weil uh, understood is that in order to prove such a statement, you just need to prove it for the fundamental harmonics, which are the exponentials. And his paper from 1916, I think is still one of my uh, all time favorites. Uh, in the case of uh, linear polynomials, um, the, the proof was earlier and can be done by elementary um, techniques. And I've, I've just have down here a little illustration uh, on what that means. So we're counting in bins um, and uniform distribution just means that the proportion of values uh, in each of the bins uh, is uh, asymptotically the same. Now, what I'm really interested in, and, and many other people, and I see many in the audience, is um, to then, once you have a sequence that's uniform distribution, distributed mod one, to ask about higher order correlations to really test the pseudo randomness of this sequence. Um, one of those um, uh, statistical tests is to look at the gap distribution. So you order um, your sequence, uh, uh, on, on the uh, unit interval mod one, and it's partitioned into uh, n intervals. Um, these are the gaps between the elements of your sequence. Um, now we have capital N points, so the average gap size will be one over N, and so we need to rescale our gaps by multiplying them by N, so they become uh, uh, quantities that are not going to zero. And then we simply ask for the distribution of gaps, which is simply this probability measure PN here defined in this way. <clears throat> Another great statistics is the two point correlation function, um, which is a little easier to handle analytically because you somehow don't need to understand how your sequence is ordered. And that's simply um, uh, the density of all spacings between the elements of your sequence um, mod one, and I've written this down here. So note again, we blow everything up by, by um, the number of elements we have. Um, and again, we normalize by one over N and ask whether there is a limit. Now, if our points in the sequence would be independent, uniformly distributed random variables, um, then a classic result from probability theory tells us that the gap distribution converges to a limit and that limit is given by the exponential distribution. Now, on the other hand, the pair correlation density converges to a limit, which is just uh, uniform. So it's not a probability uh, density, but it's a density that's uniform. And in this case, if we have something like this for a deterministic sequence, um, we would say um, that the gap statistics is Poisson or that the two point uh, uh, statistics is Poisson. So that's, uh, if you like, 
two tests of the randomness of the sequence that's uniformly distributed, not one. Um, and of course, the exciting thing is that you don't always see uh, independent random variables. And one example is uh, uh, arises in, uh, in uh, a random matrix theory where the gap distribution is given by a more complicated function, the so-called Gaudin distribution. So you just take the eigenvalues of a unitary n by n matrix. They lie on a unit circle. Um, uh, you cut the unit circle up and you map it to the interval zero one. And so you can look at the the, at the gaps in the same way. Now, if the matrix size goes to infinity, one can show that this converges to the Gaudin distribution, which um, approximately looks like that. So it's certainly not an exponential distribution. Uh, and in particular, small spacings are less likely. Uh, in the exponential distribution, small spacings are actually the most likely ones. And similarly, the two-point correlation function, the pair correlation function, Rn, also converges <clears throat> to a limit, which is uh, has a very nice, simple expression. Um, and uh, that, in fact, is the two-point correlation function of a certain determinant or um, point process. So you get different answers. And of course, uh, this is one of the big, big open problems in, uh, in number theory is to actually uh, prove uh, Montgomery's old conjecture that indeed the two-point correlation function converges to the answer of random matrices, and um, uh, and furthermore, you know, uh, uh, the, the gap distribution if one can. Um, uh, that's Olitsko's old data that you see here, spectacular numerics um, from the 80s. Um, and uh, uh, there have been some really fantastic advances uh, on this question. And if you want to read more, uh, have a look at the beautiful paper by Rudnik and Sarnak in Duke Math Journal um, from the 90s, where they prove um, that all endpoint correlation functions for the Riemann zeros uh, are compatible um, with random matrix theory um, for a very restricted class of test functions, though. So if one can extend class of test functions, you would, you would be able to prove that conjecture. Now, um, that's not really what I wanted to talk about. I just wanted to give you a little bit of the background, what motivates me and why on earth you would still think about things like, a th that, like the, three back, uh, the three gap problem. So let me come back to uh, polynomials mod one and, and see uh, what we can say about the randomness of those. Um, and there's a, a beautiful paper um, uh, that I actually just given to my new PhD student to read. Um, and that is uh, about the pair correlation function for n to the d alpha mod one. And uh, uh, Rudnik and Sana proved here that indeed it converges to the uniform distribution. So it is Poissonian. Um, we know much less about the gap distribution. We have some results due to Rudnik, Sarnak, and Saresco on subsequences if alpha is very well approximable. Unfortunately, we don't expect convergence along all subsequences in this case of well approximable alpha, um, because we also find other subsequences for which the result doesn't hold. We do expect, though, that the gap distribution and the two point correlation function converge to the Poisson answer for badly approximable alpha. Unfortunately, we have no results in this direction. So we only have results for almost every alpha, but not for an example such as alpha equals square root two. And, and here on the right-hand side, you see a little numerics. It's a beautiful thing in this subject is that you can just, even I can just go on, 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 a, on the computer and, and calculate those gaps and plot them. And you see, they look exponential absolutely close. No one knows how to prove this uh, for this example. Right, so let's start with something simpler and that is um, uh, linear polynomials. So the results of Rudnick and Sarnak worked for polynomials of the degree two and higher. So what about linear polynomials? Now you use the same program that I've, I've just done. You, you put it on for your favorite alpha. Here alpha is square root two um, and we just plot the gap distribution. So what you see here is certainly not an exponential distribution. 
And in fact, you only, three, you only see three gap sizes appearing. Now that, of course, is the famous three gap theorem. Um, and so let's explore a little bit uh, 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 what the three gap theorem is. I know many of you have seen this and you've seen the many proofs of it. But what I want to tell you about is really a, a story um, uh, by, uh, is, is a story about how you can prove the three gap theorem um, in a very simple geometric way, in a sense, to one picture. And then once you have this one picture, you have a natural generalization uh, to, to higher dimensions of the three gap theorem. And we'll, we'll discuss several of them um, uh, in a minute. But let me first try to explain to you uh, how you can see the proof of the gap theorem in just one image. So first of all, what's the three gap theorem? I mean, I said it already, you take n alpha mod one, <clears throat> you take the first n values and uh, you look at the gaps. And what you'll see is that there are only three possible distinct gap sizes for every fixed capital N. But the three uh, is independent of N. So you'll never see more than three gap sizes. The gaps themselves will be different. And you see this here in the numerics where I've taken um, uh, capital N to be 50,000 on the left-hand side and 200,000 on the right-hand side, and you clearly see that the gaps have moved. Here it's roughly a half, and here it's less than a half. So these move, and in fact, one can show that they don't converge. Um, so that's the three gap theorem. Also, if you have three gaps, then you know that the third, the largest gap is the sum of the two smaller gaps. Now, how can we um, uh, get a proof of the three gap theorem, if you like, in one picture? Now, I'm, I'm cheating, of course, not just one picture, but you will see what I mean when I, when I get to it. The, the idea, and this goes um, uh, back to a paper that I wrote with Andreas Strömbergson in the American Math Monthly uh, three years ago, the idea is very simple, it's the following. So uh, SKN here is the gap um, between Xi K, the Kth element, so K alpha mod one, and um, its uh, right nearest neighbor. Now, you can write it like this. So here we have our K alpha, and this is the the, the, the set of all possible gaps that you can have as, as L runs through the elements um, between one and capital N. And then we'll just take the smallest because that'll give us the gap, right? That's what it is. Then we shift. So we call this quantity here M. We just shift everything and we get something that looks like this. So now M, which is now the difference, L minus K, uh, runs between minus K and N minus K. And now the key observation is that you can view this quantity here on the right hand side as the smallest second component um, of a lattice where the first component falls into the strip. Yeah, so I'm gonna, since it's early in the morning or late in the night, depending which time zone you are, so I don't wanna disadvantage anyone. Let me just do that calculation for you here. So we have a lattice point, Mn, um, and we multiply it by this matrix uh, A1, which is just this. And this is our xy. Well, and if you compute this, well, what you get is M, M alpha plus N. Yeah, so it's very, very simple. Um, and here, here, is the, here is the picture. Um, uh, of, of this situation. So the, 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 green, the green domain is where we select our lattice points and we take the smallest one. And that gives us the gap size uh, for, the, for the kth element. Okay. Now you see already two by two matrices coming in. The real insight now you get is by simply saying, well, I'm just gonna not think of this matrix A1 that I had here, but I'll just, I'll just look at a general matrix. So this was A1. And I'll just replace this by M. And M will be a general matrix, two by two, uh, real coefficients and determinant one. And I'm defining now this function 
F M T. M is the matrix. T is a point in the unit interval. So T here, as you, as you can see, plays the role of how I shift. Um, and I'm simply now selecting the smallest uh, second component of my lattice so that the first component falls into the shifted interval. And then you realize that if you uh, make that particular choice, AN, AN is this matrix here now, you make this choice and you, oops, and you choose T to be K over N, you get exactly the gap. So this is now the important function, FMT. So if I understand FMT, I understand the three gap problem because it, it, it arises as a special choice of the values uh, that, that I input into the function. And in fact, now we're going to prove uh, a generalization of the three gap theorem, because what we'll, what we'll see is that this function FMT, if you fix M, so you fix any matrix M, and you think of it as a function of T, it can only take three values. Now, why is this a generalization? Well, it's because if I specialize T to those rational points K over N, uh, I need to show that that can only take three values. So if I can actually take it for all T in the interval, I have an implication um, of the three gap theorem. And that's exactly what the statement says. So first of all, well, we wanna make sure it's well-defined. And in fact, what we observe here is that's not just well-defined as a function of G, but as a function of G mod gamma. Now, if you remember, gamma here was SL2Z. SL2Z leaves the lattice Z2 invariant. And that's why FMT is in fact an invariant function. In other words, if I take gamma M, this will be the same as M. Yeah, everyone's happy? Good. Okay, so this means I have an automorphic function, FMT. And what I'm showing now is that if I fix M and I uh, uh, think of it only as a function uh, from T to FMT, uh, uh, this statement here says that it's piecewise constant as a function of T and it can take at most three values. So any choice of M, M has to be fixed because if you move M, the values change. And that's the proof of the three gap theorem. Now, how do you prove proposition two? And that's the picture, okay? That's how you see the three gap theorem in one picture. Now, the green strip is again, the one that uh, uh, is, uh, indicates the interval minus T to uh, one minus T. Um, and what we need to show is that as we take the smallest uh, second component, so the height of my lattice vector uh, in this strip, yeah, so this height here, um, I can pick up at most three distinct values. And now what you show, the way you prove prop proposition two, is you start with the smallest height lattice vector in the full interval minus one, one, that will be this one. Then you can show that the one with the second highest that's not collinear with, um, with uh, the first one must be on the left-hand side. So this would be this, would be this lattice function, yeah? And then the only third possibility is the sum of the two, which would be here, okay? So you, you know now that the three smallest values um, uh, in the strip minus one, one have to have this structure. And now all you need to show is that as you shift your green strip here from the left to the right, these are the three values you can pick up. Because this, the strip has length one, you can't pick up any, any one higher. So for instance, you wouldn't pick up this point here because that's already covered by that as the minimum. Yeah, if I had a thinner strip, then you could pick up more points, but luckily it's with one. And that's the, that's the picture of the three gap theorem. The green strip can pick up only those three um, basis vectors of our lattice of minimal height, minimal second component. Now, the nice thing about this approach is now you can generalize it to higher dimensions. 
um, because we know how to deal with higher dimensional lattices. Previous analysis um, of three gap theorems involved continued fractions. And of course, continued fractions are uh, exist uh, in, in, in higher dimensions, but they're very, very difficult in many circumstances. Um, and um, at least that's my view. The, the space of lattices in higher dimension has a beautiful geometry, geometry which we can exploit in these questions. Okay, so let me now talk about the first higher dimensional generalization. Um, and that is um, uh, my, my recent paper with Alan Haynes, uh, that's on, on the internet, where we look at higher dimensional Kronecker sequences. So N alpha mod one, that's a one dimensional Kronecker sequence. Uh, called named after Kronecker because he was the first to prove that for irrational alpha, um, the sequence is dense. Okay, so here is the setting. Um, so we take a, a fixed vector alpha uh, on a multidimensional torus, and now we look at the translate on that sequence uh, n alpha uh, mod one um, on this higher dimensional torus. So we look at the first n values. And um, now there are many, many papers in the literature um, uh, that uh, uh, have looked at higher dimensional generalizations. And I won't be able to list them all. We've tried to have a comprehensive review in our paper, but let me just mention the two most important closely related works. One is uh, at Chevalier, who looked at various interesting higher dimensional generalizations and Vijay um, with a paper, uh, the nice title, 11 distances are enough. Um, uh, and so, you know, what is the, what would you say is the, is the obvious sort of generalization if you look at a point set on a two-dimensional torus? So here's my, say, two-dimensional torus. I identify opposite sides. And now I'm looking at my, my, my sequence of points. So it'll look something like this. Um, then I wrap around so I come back up here. And you can now ask yourself, well, um, the gap distribution is something uh, about distances between nearest neighbors. So we could just simply take the Euclidean norm here and, um, and look at nearest neighbors. So you'd say, well, this guy here is my nearest neighbor. So I'm going to record that distance. I'm going to record that distance. And you, you quickly see in this particular setting, um, I only see one nearest neighbor. But that's how we are going to uh, think of our first generalization, higher dimensional generalization. So we'd simply ask how many distinct nearest neighbors are between the points of our Kronecker sequence for any fixed capital N. So if capital N points are looked at the distance between nearest neighbors. And I'm going to call um, that number, the number of distinct values that I can get as I look at all my nearest neighbors, um, Gn. Okay, here's another uh, illustration where um, uh, we have uh, two rational values of alpha and uh, um, nine points on the left-hand side and 12 points on the right-hand side. And what we see here is we see five distinct uh, length appearing as nearest neighbor distances. So let me just tell you what, what, what is displayed here. So this is, this is the point alpha, this is the point two alpha, and then I continue three alpha, four alpha, five alpha. Yeah, you see it, six alpha, seven alpha, and I always wrap around, of course, and then uh, eight alpha and nine alpha. The blue lines indicate the nearest neighbors. Um, so this is the shortest nearest neighbor distance you can see. Then you have this distance and two appears twice here. So I have it here and here. And overall, I get five distinct values. And the right-hand side is the same. Now we can do the same in three dimensions, of course. And here's an example, n equal 15, where again, for a rational vector, we have um, seven distinct distances. Okay, so certainly in dimensions two and three, we don't have a three gap theorem. That's clear because I already have two examples with five and seven. Um, but what can one say? What's a good upper bound for the number of distinct distances in this case? Well, it turns out in two dimensions, the answer is five. So we have a five distance theorem. Um, um, 
And uh, this is really the, the, the principal result of, of my uh, recent paper with Alan Haynes. Um, so no matter what choice of alpha you take, no matter what choice of capital N you take, um, you get three, that's our three distance theorem. I just wanna say one thing here, why I've, I've listed this again, just a trivial observation that if you look at gaps, that's not necessarily the nearest neighbors um, because uh, the gaps are these, are the, are the length of the intervals that your sequence partitions the, the unit interval. Um, but of course, for instance, these two here, they are, the, they are each other's nearest neighbors. So the set of nearest neighbor distances is a subset of the set of gaps. And so in principle, it could, it could be that we only have a two uh, nearest neighbor distance theorem um, uh, because you might always miss out uh, the longer distance. So in other words, the gap distribution is about the nearest neighbor to the right. You don't care about the nearest neighbor to the left. If that's closer, you still have the gap to the right. But in any case, you can very simply, of course, show that also uh, there can be three nearest neighbor distances in dimension one. Now dimension two, that's our main result. We have an upper bound of five. And with this one example I showed you uh, uh, in the two dimension case, or these two examples, um, that's a sharp result, at least for one alpha and for one n. In higher dimensions, our bounds are not as uh, sharp as we would like them to be. So in dimension three, we have uh, a bound of 41. And in higher dimensions, this is the result. Um, uh, it is related um, uh, to uh, the um, covering of uh, a unit sphere, the surface of a unit sphere by balls of radius one half. Um, so basically uh, the, the number you see here on the left-hand side is exactly related to that. In fact, it's two times the minimal number of balls of radius one half you need to cover a unit sphere. Um, okay. Now, what else can we say here? Um, sorry, I've just activated my voice recognition. Uh, before I say this, um, uh, here, are the, here are the, uh, the, the, the numerical values, um, that's three, five, we don't think these guys are sharp. So that's really a great challenge to try to improve um, our upper bounds in higher dimensions. Our results also hold if you replace the, the cubic torus by any uh, torus. Um, you can also um, replace the Euclidean metric um, that we've chosen here, which is a standard one by any flat Riemannian metric on the torus. And in fact, things become simpler when you replace the Euclidean metric by the max norm. In fact, there we have a result of Chevalier in dimension B equals two, who proved that we also get at most five numbers, uh, uh, five distinct gaps. Um, and that's been recently- um, Jens? Yes? Uh, your screen sharing just stopped. Ah, okay, sorry. This is, can we stop this? Ah, now it's gone. So let me, I think this was my, um, my Siri or something, which just started. Let me reshare. Okay. Okay. Okay, I, can, I see the PDF slides again. Okay, super, thank you. Um, so I was just saying that um, if, you, if you replace the Euclidean norm by a maximum norm, the, the problem becomes simpler because it is, if you like, simpler to cover by cubes than by spheres. Um, and there's a very nice short paper by uh, 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 Alan Haynes. Uh, the proof really becomes very short um, uh, in, in, uh, in the case of, of the maximum rather than Euclidean norm. So I also recommend that. Um, he's done that work with an undergraduate student at, at Houston. Okay, now how about lower bounds? So we've seen that the upper bound is five and we have other upper, upper bounds in higher dimensions. Um, this theorem here um, 
enables us to take any example, any numerical example that we have, like the ones I showed you a few slides ago, and turn it into a result that holds actually for almost all alpha and for an infinite subsequence of n. And why is that? Well, this theorem says that um, we can find a set of full Lebesgue measure so, so that for any alpha in that set, um, the limb sup of the number of distinct gaps is bounded uh, below by the example that we have. So here is my, let me choose a nice color here. This is, if you like, um, uh, the example that we have, for instance, in two dimensions, we've seen an example of five values. So this quantity here will be uh, uh, at least five. Um, and so that gives us uh, a, a lower bound on the number of gaps, this theorem. Now this theorem uses ergodic theory on the space of lattices. In fact, it uses the fact that certain trajectories in the space of lattices, whose initial condition is related to alpha, are dense. And I'll, I'll come back to that a little later in the, uh, in the talk, how exactly that works. Now, don't worry too much about this formulation. What, what we're really saying here is that it doesn't just work for uh, a specific uh, subsequence of integers ni, but it holds for, for even for very sparse subsequences of ni, as long as they are uh, sub-exponential. So these are lower bounds. And now um, let's just remember, now something very funny is gonna happen. So we have our five gap theorem in two dimensions and we can prove that in any dimensions, the number of gaps is finite. So that's already quite a striking result, I think, just the finiteness alone. Um, now let's remember what the original three gap theorem was about. It was about the gaps. And as I said, not the nearest neighbors. Yeah, so we have our gaps. And as I said, we can think of gaps as the distance to the nearest neighbor to the right. Yeah, so I'm always starting here and I'm looking to the right. Um, and now this suggests another higher dimensional generalization where we don't just look at the nearest neighbor in any direction, but we fix a cone of directions. Let me make a little drawing over here. So, so we're now on the unit torus, which I won't draw. I just draw my point. Here it is. And now, well, let me draw a few points. So these are the points on my sequence, on the torus, if you like. Um, and now we are only going to look in a certain direction. We're only going to see whether we can find a nearest neighbor in this direction of cone. Now, for each of the points of our elements, we choose the same cone. We always want to look in the same direction. Yeah? So we, we sort of scan the real horizon, but not in every direction around us, but just in a given cone of directions. And so we are now just recording the nearest neighbors in this cone of direction. So this would be an example here, even though this point is closer, I'm not gonna kick it because it's not in my cone. It's not in my, uh, so if you like, you know, you have a bad radar and you're just looking in, a, in, a, in one direction. Good radars look in all directions, but this one is only sweeping uh, a particular direction. And now um, uh, I'm gonna call that cone angle tau. So this is my tau. And I'm fixing a cone uh, uh, for all points. Um, it turns out the result is independent on uh, which direction I fix my cone. The only important thing is the opening angle. And so we have another theorem here that gives us an upper bound on the number of distinct distances in that particular cone direction. And you see, um, so this is just dimension two, so really just two dimensional. Um, and, and now uh, the answer depends on the cone angle. Now, what we're doing here, as you realize, our cone angles are large, they're bigger than pi. So I'm actually also allowed or actually required to look uh, uh, a little bit behind my back, yeah? Um, and the answer is five. So five is the original theorem. That's uh, looking in every direction. Here, the cone angle is two pi. 
And then we get five, nine, eight, nine, eight, 12 plus a certain formula um, for cone angles um, that are close to pi. Um, yeah, is, is it clear what, what we're doing here? So this, this case down here would be, if, I, if, if this is my lattice point, my cone angle uh, would, um, my cone would look a bit like this, right? So this is tau and, and this, this is the direction that I'm looking at. And this goes, as you can see, to infinity. So the bound becomes really bad as tau approaches pi, goes to infinity. So we don't really have an upper bound for tau equal to pi. But now here's the surprise, okay? If I look at uh, acute cone angles, which are less than pi, I don't have a finite gap theorem anymore. It breaks down. So this is the statement of this theorem that if I look in focus directions, and this works actually in arbitrary dimensions. So I, I take a cone, I assume that that cone is contained in some open hemisphere. So if you think of the two dimensional case, all we're saying here is that um, the, the cone angle, uh, the, that the cone is contained in the half plane, which means that tau is less than pi. Um, then for, Almost every alpha I can again find um, uh, and any and any sub exponential sequence of ends, um, I get infinitely many gaps. That's what this statement says here. On the other hand, I can also find a subsequence for which I have bounded gaps for the same alpha. Yeah, that's that's this statement. Um, furthermore, what we can prove is that. If alpha is badly approximable, and so that's a measure zero set, then in fact I have I have a finite uh, uh, gap phenomenon. Now, as you will see um, from the second variation of the three gap problem that I'm now going to discuss with you, these results again use the agotic, uh, agotic theory of um, flows on homogeneous spaces, and in particular here our homogeneous space is the space of lattices. Um, and I hope I'll have some time to illustrate that to you. But before I go into that, let me, um, let me talk about the second natural generalization of uh, the three gap theorem. And that's now not plotting points in higher dimension, but rather taking the values of a linear form. So again, we start with a uh, vector alpha, we fix a bounded convex set, just think of D as being a ball, that's good enough. Um, and we now look at all the values of uh, m alpha mod one, where m now is, an, is a vector. So that's a linear form, mod one. And we took, take all integers here inside our ball. And we again ask, well, what's the number of distinct gaps now between the elements of this sequence, which is again a sequence on the unit interval with opposite sides of everything. So R mod Z. Um, so that's a little bit closer to the original question because we now look at, again, a one-dimensional sequence. And we want to understand whether we can get upper bounds when we make our ball larger and larger and larger, right? That's like uh, the original n going to infinity because we'll take more and more values. Now, this is, again, a very old problem that was studied by Boschenitz and Dyson. Um, uh, Erdős looked at this, uh, Gill and Simpson, many other people. Um, uh, ha have studied this problem. And again, uh, what I'll try to explain to you is again, the, this geometric approach um, uh, in terms of the space of lattices will actually give you really deep insights into this question. Um, there is a, 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 I mentioned the private correspondence between Dyson and, and Boschanitsan and, and both of them are my heroes. Uh, and you see here uh, in the, his letter to Boschanitsan, um, uh, Dyson uh, asked ask him about this question, asked him to check this paper. Um, and of course, um, uh, you know, these were outstanding mathematicians. Uh, Freeman Dyson just passed away this year and, and Michael Boschenitz um, last year. Um, a lot of the things that, that uh, I'm interested in, I'm working on was motivated by, by these two. Also the problem of square root n. Mod one comes from Boschenitz and um, uh, Zerv Rutnik. Uh, who I've seen on the list here uh, knows this well. Um, 
So uh, it's, it's great to see that they also were interested in this problem. And here you see uh, um, Dyson's theorem that says if um, alpha is, the components of alpha are algebraic integers um, uh, belonging to a number field of degree d plus one, um, and are independent, then we only get a bounded number of gaps, no matter what the choice of, of alpha is. Um, now, our theorem here, which was published just this year, um, uh, makes very similar statements as the ones that you've seen um, in the first higher dimensional generalization for the Kronecker sequence. We can prove um, that in fact, for almost every alpha, this is not true. We don't have a bounded uh, number of distinct gaps uh, between the elements of the sequence. So um, we uh, have uh, uh, the sup is infinity. And again, we find also a subsequence for which um, we have bounded gaps. Again, this will follow from the ergodic theoretic uh, approach. The many uh, results in this direction, the, the, the best is uh, due to Lecher Röder and the, the students, this group of students for which they won the, the Siemens Prize um, a, a few years ago, where they also showed um, not for almost every alpha, but a smaller set um, of half to, half to dimension three, three halves, um, that um, the, same, the, the same result is true. Um, and uh, again, Erdős asked actually the question whether we have an infinite number of distinct gaps whenever we have linear independence. And as you've seen, uh, uh, Dyson answered that question, it's not true. So you can have alphas where you have, which are linearly independent. If they're badly approximable, you get a, a finite uh, uh, number of gaps, uh, no matter how large your cover uh, parameter is. Okay, and that's uh, basically uh, the statement of this theorem, uh, which I attribute here to Boschenitzen and Dyson and Blecher and, uh, uh, and his group. So now what remains is just for me to give you um, uh, an impression of why this geometric approach that I explained to you in the three gap theorem really works here and what the kind of ergodic theory is that, that's involved. I'm gonna do that very quickly on just two slides. Um, because really what I see is, is the key input here is what I showed you in the first, this one picture for the three gap theorem. That's really behind this. The ergodic theory that we're using here is by now pretty um, well established. So, and you see what uh, the, the similarity with, with, um, with the three gap theorem. So here we have our linear form. We have the element K alpha and we look at the gaps. So again, we, um, uh, the gaps will, will satisfy this formula. This will be all distinct spacings. Again, L are the neighbors, all the neighbors uh, over which we are summing. And we simply take the minimum. Um, this N here gives us the mod one condition. We rewrite it as before and you see, just as in the one dimensional setting, um, where we had a two dimensional lattice emerging, we now, have again that the kth gap is given by the smallest height, and by height I mean the, the, the last component of the lattice the vector, the smallest height of uh, uh, all the lattice points that fall into a certain cylinder. Yeah, and the cylinder I'm shifting again. So I'm defining now uh, the analog things I have, um, uh, I'm defining my function. Uh, as before, FMT, now it lives in a ZD plus one, in the letter ZD plus one, sheared by a matrix M, so that's a D plus one dimensional lattice. And, um, uh, and as before, we get the, the case gap by evaluating this function uh, at a specific matrix AB and at a specific value of T. So everything works as before. And uh, then we um, uh, can go through the, um, the same procedure and the key input here, the key estimate. Now the geometry of course is much more complicated in the space of higher dimension lattice, as you will appreciate. And that's where all the work goes in. So I don't wanna sell this as a completely trivial approach. 
the ideas are always, uh, I think, the important thing and how you translate it, but then the real work starts. And the real work here is now to show that if you want to get a lower bound, if you want to show that there are really infinitely many distant gaps, what you need to do is to, to prove something like this for your function fmt, where m is now fixed, and t again varies, the piecewise con constant function in t, and t varies, um, and so uh, maybe I've gone a bit fast, this gm is the distinct number of values that our function fmt takes as t varies. And what we are uh, producing here, and it's just the same in the, as, as for the Kronika sequence in that setting, is we find little neighborhoods in our space of lattices where my function can take uh, an, an, uh, exceed uh, uh, an arbitrary large value. So gm is the number of gaps. gm is also a function on g mod gamma. And what we find is little neighborhoods where gm can be bigger than r. And I can do this for any r. So our manifold is a non-compact space. And so these neighborhoods will be in the cusp of this space. Really, the really crazy thing is why doesn't it work in, in dimension uh, one when we have SL2R and mod SL2Z, that's the modular surface and there it doesn't work. So there we don't find these neighborhoods. So it's a real higher dimensional phenomenon. Um, so when D is equal to one, this function GM is really bounded. Yeah, so that's that's really the interesting thing. So the the higher dimensional cusp really are critical in finding those large values. Um, and once we have that, once we know that we are looking at a function that can have arbitrary large values in open neighborhoods, and we can then use density of orbits to prove all the statements that we want. So um, uh, if you remember, where did we evaluate our our um, uh, function g of m, well, at this matrix, one alpha zero one, and then here we had, now I forgot what the parameter was that I uh, assigned to it. I think I called it t or something like that. Uh, no, I don't remember. So it would be something like one over t, uh, d by d matrix, zero, zero, t to the d. And you see, you can write this matrix in this way. Um, I'm writing it like this because then it parametrizes uh, a flow, the value S. And what you can now use is the fact that as you evaluate, um, uh, as you look at the trajectory um, of an initial point M, our initial point M here would be uh, this one, one alpha zero one. So I've, I've drawn it here. As we look at this trajectory, um, it becomes dense in the manifold. So if it's becoming dense in the manifold, it will visit those little neighborhoods in which my function can take arbitrary large values. And that's why um, uh, we find arbitrary large values for this particular choice of um, uh, uh, alpha. Um, and that will happen for almost every alpha. Now, on the other hand, if alpha is badly approximable by rationals, we have a theorem due to Dani that says, um, uh, it's down here, that says um, that if alpha is badly approximable, this kind of trajectory here will remain in a compact set in your manifold. So if it will remain in a compact set, then also the uh, function will not visit those neighborhoods um, um, where it takes arbitrary large values. And um, therefore we have a bounded uh, uh, gap phenomenon. Okay, so that's just a, a quick uh, uh, tour now. I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. I hope I'm given, I've given you a really uh, uh, quick, uh, insight into, into what is really the core of, of the ideas of, of these two papers. Um, um, of course, there are many, many uh, geometric estimates that go into proving that actually the upper bound for the Kronecker sequence is exactly five or 41 in three dimensions and so on. 
Um, but I haven't talked about that at all. My intention here was really to just explain to you the geometric starting point of, of our theory and then how we um, uh, explore it. And the, the, the space of lattices is really extremely helpful because you see, we can forget in our analysis about alpha and we can forget about n. We just think about a fixed lattice and how many values a certain function can take with respect to that fixed lattice. So it's no longer an analysis where you need to worry about large parameters and so on. Um, that's really what makes it work. But in, in, in the last uh, two minutes, if I, if I have them, what I'd like to do is just take the corner back because I've started by telling you about the motivation for this problem coming from understanding uh, uh, the pseudo randomness in, in, in these sequences. And as we've seen, um, uh, for the linear polynomials mod one, uh, we don't see randomness at all. You know, we don't even get convergence of the step get to statistics. On the other hand, when we look at n squared alpha mod one, we have almost no proofs. I mean, there are some beautiful papers there, but we can't prove that this is a gap distribution. So uh, there's one solution here, and that's randomize alpha in uh, the linear case. And if you do that, um, you can uh, uh, show that actually you do get a limiting gap distribution. Now we look at n alpha mod one. We only have three gaps, but now we randomize those gaps. We just average over alpha. And so then we get a beautiful, nice gap distribution. There's a recent paper of Polanco, Schultz, and Zaharesco where they get nice uh, remainder estimates, but the problem really goes back to some really nice work by Blecher, Maisel, Sinai, and in particular, Greenman, who was the first to compute this limiting distribution that you see here in this picture. It's an explicit, beautiful formula. Um, uh, that's really, uh, I think, where I want to stop, except to say that our ergodic theoretic machinery also allows us to uh, prove the convergence of gap distributions um, and, and higher dimensional variants uh, um, uh, in the same way. In fact, it gives a very nice transparent proof for these things. Um, and finally, uh, just as a, a little take home message, there's something really incredible here. I mean, we've looked at linear sequences and we looked at higher order polynomials. How about logs? And I'm not talking about these logs. This is, a, <laughs> this is my log shed out in the garden here. I'm talking about log n mod one. And you see here, uh, if we take log n mod one and we choose the base B carefully to be e to the one fifth, it's supposed to be transcendental. That's the only important thing. And it's supposed to be close to one. So take the base that's close to one and uh, transcendental and you plot your gap statistics. You see a curve like that. It's almost exponential. So the red, the red curve here, that's an exponential distribution. Um, and the true answer is this, is this, uh, is this other curve, uh, which we can compute. And um, I leave you with this mystery. So why on earth is log n, this slowly increasing sequences, looking so random? We can even prove that here. Um, um, uh, and we can prove anything uh, about n squared alpha mod one. I mean, anything is an, an overstatement, but we can't prove that it converges to a gap distribution. n squared alpha mod one should be much more random than log n mod one. I think you agree with that. So I leave you with that mystery. If you want to learn more, uh, have a look at my paper with with Andreas Twenbergs on um, uh, uh, a few years uh, a few years ago. Uh, if you want to read more on the previous topics, here's a list and I'm. Uh, Grateful for you being here. Thank you for your attention, and I'm very happy to take questions.